invited me to come participate with you all today. I really wanted to come be a fly on the wall and just learn from the groups here today and learn from Jaime about what urban conservation conversations are going on and projects and practices in Houston, how that might look comparatively with Dallas. Our urban conservation work in Dallas is relatively new. So Jaime originally asked me to come share two on the ground projects, especially one that's halfway through in Dallas, but I wanted to kind of take a little bit of a higher up approach and share some of the ur the framework that the Nature Conservancy is using with our urban conservation programs around the world and then kind of c land in Dallas. So with that, oops, I never start pushing the right buttons right away. Okay, so I should be using the left button when I go to the next one. We'll see. We'll play again. So the mission of the Nature Conservancy is to preserve the lands and waters upon which all life depends. And we've been working in an urban setting. I'm pushing the wrong button again. Hang on. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, so you know, we've been working around the world. Uh, we're in 72 countries. We say we're the world's largest conservation-based organizations. And most folks, when they hear about the Nature Conservancy, they think about our traditional work. We've protected over 100 million acres. Have. Um, eco ecosystem restoration conservation projects that are land-based, marine-based, uh, riparian freshwater. But we've, we've worked at the intersection of people and the environment in all of our projects throughout time. Um, so that's not new to us. In the urban setting, I'm still pushing the wrong buttons here. No. It should be, so you see the keys on the... Oh, those keys. Did that work? Still not working. Hang on. Your computer slightly. So the Nature Conservancy's early work in the arena has to do with water funds and urban forestry health. So a quarter of the nation's forest in the city areas. I am not a forester or an arborist, but that also reflects sort of how we practice in our urban settings. We partner with local organizations where we have expertise in the our projects is in. We also work in water funds where we have down, we've come up with some models where downstream beneficiaries of clean water, like cities, pay for conservation practices along in freshwater areas upstream. Um, San Antonio is one of the leaders. We have water funds in over 35 cities around the world. There we go. So Dallas, this is an area of Dallas. Um, how does this land in Dallas? Missing. No, there we go. Okay. So about 15 years ago, the Nature Conservancy started saying, if we're going to be very serious about preserving the lands and waters upon which all life depends, we need to look at the urban centers. By 2050, around the world, 70% of the population will live in cities. 80% of the world's resources and it's going to cost trillions of the population. So as an organization, um, we have included cities, healthy cities, five major priorities of our organization. Protecting lands and waters, which we recognize the Conservancy, which has become top priority. Building healthy cities, and water system, and connecting people to nature. In North America, when we talk about building cities where people and nature thrive, we're focusing our work in North America with urban heat and air quality, urban water that can be flooding, that can also be water quality, some of the things that Kelly was talking about. That was very exciting for me to learn about Houston's Park and Rec Department officially recognizing green stormwater infrastructure in your projects. Transforming the urban landscape, but that's more system-wide. How do we build cities that um, have clean air and water, urban water protection, and biodiversity? We have 23 cities where we have folks like Jaime and myself located. Our on-ground projects may look differently depending on the needs, the gaps, um, and the opportunities. We also have about seven cities where we're focusing city-specific work, but on top of that, we have 35 additional cities where we're doing projects like the water funds. OK, now we're landing in Dallas. So I've been in Dallas for just a little over a year. Everywhere where the Nature Conservancy has 
funded and begun our urban work, we really work highly collaboratively. All the work I'm doing in Dallas is in partnership. And I spend six months to a year, and Jaime's been already in this area. He knows many of you from his work already, which is gives, gives his work already a leg up in, in Houston. Um, I moved to Dallas from the Benton area. It was only 40 minutes up the road, but it's a completely different perspective. So I've spent the past year working hand in hand with the Trust for Public Land, uh, the, the Texas Trees Foundation, and then several other of our leaders in the area to say, okay, who are the leaders, what are the environmental health issues, and what are the opportunities and gaps, and how can we work collaboratively to kind of scale is a big word we use. One of the benefits, you know, when people hear the Nature Conservancy, local leaders in Dallas, they've said, okay, what are you going to do? you going to try to take some of our resources away and reinvent the wheel? No. What our perspective is when we enter into a city is, how can we bring some of the science that we have around the world or our access to skilled resources to work coll collectively and collaboratively and to share lessons out? So maybe um, our partner, the, the Texas Trees Foundation, may have come up with a protocol that works really well in some of our urban neighborhoods. How do we then take some of those lessons to our other cities around the world? So in Dallas, I'm doing it again. Wrong button. Okay, we're the fourth largest area in the United States. We have this map right here was produced um, with two of our colleagues, the Trust for Public Land and the Texas Trees Foundation. We're the third fastest warming city in the U.S. This is a heat map. Um, our temperatures for five months. We average above 90 degrees. in Dallas, uh, in the areas of Dallas where people don't have fully functioning air conditions. It's, it's a real serious issue that also overlays when we use some of our data to canopy cover. We have some hot areas of town where people don't have adequate health services, um, and then we stack our challenges. Um, DFW, we have never met uh, federal regulations for ozone attainment in DFW. We also have very high rates for childhood asthma. In fact, Dallas um, leads, is one of the top uh, rates of childhood hospitalizations from asthma in the whole state. 40% um, of our residents don't have access to a nearby park. And we also have problems with flooding. We have not had a Harvey, but we have consistent, persistent problems with flooding, including flash flooding throughout the city. And again, in Dallas, our flash flooding areas are often in the poorest uh, sectors of town. In fact, there's a, there's a we're highly managed by flood protection, and we've done a pretty good job at the city with our flood protection, but when we have a levee system that actually they physically stopped building the levees when we got to the southern sector of Dallas. So there's an actual geographic uh, limit to the flooding controls. So we spent about six months diving deep. We invited stakeholders from the healthcare sector, the academic sector, many folks like yourselves in the room, local government, regional local government, federal, the EPA, and we said when we looked at these uh, air quality, urban heat, air qual um, water quality and quantity, and green space loss, what can we do? What are we going to do together? And we came up with our four main strategies working on collaboratively. We are working on developing a replicable protocol for greening Dallas neighborhood by neighborhood, and I'm going to give a case study. Uh, we're also working very closely with some leaders. We have a good relationship with the director of the Office of the Environmental Quality and with the chief resiliency officer. Her job is to enhance resiliency throughout all of Dallas. Um, Dallas is one of 100 global cities funded to look at that from that look at resiliency, climate resiliency, uh, chronic and chronic resiliency um, to problems with, like equity, what happens if we have a Harvey, how can neighborhoods respond. Um, anyway, so we're working closely with the city on stormwater drainage, air quality, all of these issues. Filling key gaps in science. This map was produced um, in, in Dallas. We have a stormwater in land where they have a decision support tool where they layer equity. They have a layer for equity, a layer for heat, and a layer for water, for flooding, and for health. And we can stack those layers however we want to from a planning perspective and say, where do we want to invest uh, in green infrastructure, whether it be parks, trees, uh, green stormwater infrastructure, where the challenges and where the potential uh, benefits. And institutionalizing collaboration. This is one of our tree planting days for our project Cool and Connected Oak Cliff, and that's the director of the 
Office of Environmental Quality with his children there. So Cool and Connected Oak Cliff was what I was supposed to talk about because this is our first on the ground project in Dallas. We're really, um, just fast forward to the next This is a blow up of that heat map produced by the Trust for Public Lands. We wanted to overlay physical heat with low tree canopy, low park access, uh, health concerns, cardiovascular health concerns in equity. So this is a very uh, low, high percentage of low-income households. Um, the higher reds are the, the worst for all of those stacked challenges. And we were funded, we were one of four cities receiving funds to plant trees with the community. So community engagement is a very important piece of this project, especially when we talk about the watering concerns because we can plant the trees, but we'll have a thousand dead trees at the end of this project if we can't work effectively with the community. So um, I don't have a, I don't need the pointer. The zigzag is a trail being put in by the, uh, by the county. And the four squares are schools. We have South Oak Cliff High School at the south part of the picture, and then three other schools. What we ended up doing is partnering with two schools. Uh, on the left, we have an elementary school, and on the right, we have a middle school. And then we are planting 1,000 total trees in this zone with the community over the course of the year. We've already planted at one school, and then about 500 trees total are in the ground. Um, and we have used our partner at Texas All of this is our infographic, but they use iTree to calculate and estimate ecosystem services. We estimate that we'll have $2.9 million in benefits over the lifetime of the trees. We're talking about health benefits, uh, water retention, air quality, and whatnot, and engaging about 3,000 volunteers. And it's very exciting. I'm going to show the video. Do you want me to show it now or talk about Breathe Easy Dallas while we load up the video? Uh, talk about Breathe Easy Dallas. Okay, I only have one slide. That's our other on-the-ground project. It's just been launched actually two weeks ago. We are partnering strong, strong partnership with the city of Dallas and also working with Dallas Independent School District to uh, study two components. We know that we have a very serious issue with quality. We know that we have a very serious issue with pediatric asthma. We know that the poor areas of town have been, we, we have a lot of fatalities from asthma in certain areas of town. Um, we don't have high quality local data on uh, air quality, especially non-ozone. We have regulatory measurement of ozone for the region in the airshed, but we don't have neighborhood-based air quality. And in recent years, the technology has improved for uh, lower cost sensors. So we're selecting nine schools, DISD schools. There's really um, more, than, more than 30 schools where we have very high rates of asthma and absenteeism from asthma. And we're installing at nine schools air sensors, and we're collecting baseline measures for the first year for air quality and baseline measures for absenteeism related to asthma. So we're working with school nurses to measure that. Then year two, we're gonna have um, three types of interventions, nature-based solutions, trees and vegetative screens um, at three of the schools, a health, a campus-based health intervention at three of the schools, and an anti-idling intervention. So the science will be helpful as we look for practical solutions and we wanna share out those lessons. Um, and then I think I'll just show this last slide and then we'll sh show the video. This is a path. As we dug into this video, um, it's going to show us the, the human side of the story. As we dug into this neighborhood cool and connected project, all three organizations realized that this is really a model worth scaling up throughout Dallas. And we plan to deeply green all of the neighborhoods in Dallas together. And we, w we hope to increase the efficiencies of our partnership, reduce the costs, and, and work with the city to on the maintenance issue, keeping for two years, keeping those trees watered so we don't have, the goal is 250,000 trees at a minimum to improve our outcomes from urban heat. These 73 neighborhoods, we did two passes with Smart Growth for Dallas's mapping tool. We included equity data and heat data only in this first pass. And we have 73 very hot, low-income neighborhoods in Dallas where we want to start by greening with trees, green stormwater infrastructure, and parks. So bringing those for stacked benefits together. And we, that's, our, that's our main focus for the next five to 10 years in Dallas. And with that, we're